अनुसंधान और गुजरात इंटीग्रेटेड क्लासरूम सैटेलाइट ना माध्यम थी जोड़ती कड़ी एटले संधान गुड मॉर्निंग माय डियर स्टूडेंट्स इन दिस लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू लुक एट द बार्ड ऑफ एवन हैव यू हर्ड ऑफ द बार्ड ऑफ एवन ऑफ कोर्स यू हैव द बार्ड इज द पोएट एंड एवन इज द रिवर on the banks of which he was born stratford upon avon is where he was born who am i talking about one of the greatest writers of all times all around the world i'm talking of william shakespeare william shakespeare as we all know is remembered greatly for his plays yes and you have heard of his tragedies and his comedies and his historical plays but today it's going to be great fun to be looking at another aspect of this great dramatist this great dramatist william shakespeare whose 36 plays are still remembered but we are going to talk today about him as a poet this is the paper in which you are studying the elizabethan age you have looked at the characteristics of the elizabethan age you know why it's called the elizabethan age of course you know why it's called the elizabethan age because queen elizabeth the first was ruling over great britain she was a great queen she was remembered for the way she sent her emissaries all over the world and you probably remember that it was an age of prosperity it was an age of travel sea travel in fact some of them came even to india sir thomas row and knocked at the gates of jahangir's court well that's another story let's go to the elizabethan age and let's look at the slide the first slide that we have who are we talking about shakespeare and what are we talking about shakespeare as a poet what are his years 1564 to 1616 quite a long life but a great deal of writing that he did i said quite a long life because i'm comparing him to writers like marlow who died very young at that period but the amount of work that shakespeare could do in his lifetime is really unbelievable Have you seen a picture of Shakespeare? Well, this is what Shakespeare looked like. We have portraits, not photographs, right? We have portraits of Shakespeare, and this is what Shakespeare looked like. So I'm going to talk to you today in this lecture about Shakespeare as a poet. To talk about Shakespeare as a poet, I will first have to talk about Elizabethan poetry. what are the major characteristics of elizabethan poetry because we have to understand shakespeare in the context of the age in which he lived the most important quality of elizabethan poetry is its lyrical quality there is a music which is innate which is inherent in the poetry of this period and what was the most popular form of poetry the sonnet why the sonnet you may ask the sonnet was very popular because the poets considered it a good vehicle in 14 lines a good medium a good tool when i use the word vehicle a good medium a good tool in which to express their ideas so the sonnet was popular i'll talk about other poets who use the sonnet later in this lecture what did they write about their favorite theme the favorite topic was love poetry i will talk about astrophel and stella a little later there was also courtly poetry what do we mean by courtly poetry you know one court that is you know the court of the judges but there is also another court for which there is another common word the darbar the darbar of akbar for example where he had his nine gems the navratnas The court of Queen Elizabeth was also as famous was filled with great nobles and courtiers 
and many of the poets of this period loved to write poetry in praise of Queen Elizabeth, in praise of their queen. And such poetry is called courtly poetry. So, Queen Elizabeth was at the centre of such poetry. These are the general characteristics of Elizabethan poetry. Why am I talking about it? As I have already said, William Shakespeare lived in the Elizabethan age. So, we will understand Shakespeare as a poet better if we have some idea about the age in which he lived and the kind of poetry that was written then. Who are the major poets of this period? I would like to talk about two of them, just mentioned Raleigh and Chapman, but I would like to mention, talk about Edmund Spencer and Sir Philip Sidney. You might remember the Shepherd's Calendar by Edmund Spencer, right? You might remember the eclogues, you know, the twelve eclogues that it had. These were written with pastoral characters and therefore it is called the Shepherd's Calendar. There are twelve eclogues in this poem, that is one for each month of the year and the poet beautifully describes the season, the scenery, nature of each month and all the characters are shepherds and shepherdesses and that is why he calls it the shepherd's calendar. We also have another work which is Epithalmian. But I would like to talk to you for a minute about the fairy queen. I just mentioned that Queen Elizabeth was at the centre of a lot of courtly poetry. The Fairy Queen actually is a long work, it is an allegory, but it can be considered both as a political allegory as well as a social allegory. And of course, the Fairy Queen, you must notice the spelling when you go back and check it in your textbook, F-A-E-R-I-E and a queen spelt with E at the end, that is Q-U-E-E-N-E. -E. So, you have the fairy queen which is a political allegory. Then you have Sydney. I mentioned the love poems. Well, the love sonnets of Sydney, called Astrophel and Stella. Actually, it's a collection of sonnets. I'm mentioning this because later on I'm going to talk about the sonnets of Shakespeare. Astrophel and Stella is a collection of 108 sonnets by Sir Philip Sidney. Of course, you might remember Sir Philip Sidney for his criticism also. You might study that later in uh, the other semesters, in later semesters. But at the moment, we are looking at Astrophel and Stella, the star and the stargazer. Stella means star and Astrophel means the stargazer. So, the beloved seems to be as far away for the lover as the star is for somebody who is looking at it from earth. So, you have Astrophel and Stella. I just allow Raleigh to go by, but I would like to mention Chapman because you probably remember Homer, Keats's famous sonnet, sonnet on looking into Chapman's Homer. Chapman is somebody who had translated Homer and that is why I thought I would mention him here for you. So, the major poets, the two major poets that you have to remember and about whom you would be studying in detail or have already studied in detail are Edmund Spencer and Sir Philip Sidney. Let us now look at the poems of Shakespeare. I want to divide the poetry of Shakespeare into three parts. Number one, the longer poems. Number two, the sonnets. And number three, the songs in his plays. In all these three kinds of poetry, we see Shakespeare as a poet. So, let me begin by talking about his longer poems. There are two long poems of Shakespeare, which we do remember. And one is called Venus and Adonis and the other is called The Rape of Lucrece. Now, Venus and Adonis was published in 1593 and it is a story which is taken from the metamorphosis. Have you heard the word metamorphosis? 
it means a total transformation a change and there is a book called the metamorphosis in which characters are changed to different animal forms you might have heard stories of how somebody because of magic is changed into maybe some fairy tale somebody becomes a f frog or somebody becomes a beast etc so also the story of Venus and Adonis is taken from the metamorphosis and it is a young man who attempts the young man is Adonis who attempts to persuade Venus to love him it's a love poem very simple but it's a long poem it's not like a love sonnet it's a long poem Venus and Adonis the story taken from metamorphosis Adonis the young man is trying to persuade Venus to love him there's beautiful poetry there is melody what is one of Shakespeare's greatest qualities the lyrical quality is already there you can see the melody in his poetry it is all in a pastoral setting there is a great deal of imagery there are similes I'm saying all this because remember when you are doing Shakespeare as a dramatist some of the qualities that we associate with his style are all these which I've just mentioned and therefore some of these literary qualities which make him stand out which makes his style stand out can already be seen in this poem Venus and Adonis which was written much before he wrote his great plays now the imagery that one sees in this play in this poem <coughs> to a great extent is animal imagery Venus is called an eagle is called a vulture is called a falcon because she is the one who is chasing she is the chaser and who is the quarry who is the prey the prey is Adonis so you have the animal imagery I would rather call it the bird imagery to a great extent in this poem Venus and Adonis interestingly much later in King Lear we are to see again the animal imagery at its worst because Shakespeare uses very terrible animal imagery to describe the daughters Goneril and Regan the daughters of King Lear he calls them the worst kinds of animals because of the way they treated their father but that is to come later and that is another topic and another lecture so let's come on to the next poem now the rape of Lucris it is a poem in which there are lots of speeches it's a poem which was published in 1594 soon after Venus and Adonis in 1593 you have 1594 the, uh, the rape of Lucris it seems to be a very deliberate study it's a longer poem much longer than Venus and Adonis it is filled with speeches you know which seems a little strange in poetry but then since the story is like that you have a lot of speeches both by Tarkin and the lament of Lucris there is almost an internal looking because you find Tarkin debating with himself talking to himself talking about himself and you also find Tarkin in conversation with Lucris so these are the speeches that you see in this poem that you read in this poem the two long poems of Shakespeare are not very popular today when we talk about Shakespeare's poetry we do talk about these two because he began his poetry writing with this the subject I've already talked about the style is ornamental because there's so much of imagery there's so much of symbolism also that you see in the poem in addition to that 
there are individual lines of great beauty. But when we think of Shakespeare, these two poems much later come into our idea of Shakespeare as a writer. So then, what do we think of when we think of Shakespeare as a poet? We think of his sonnets. We think of his sonnets which began in 1609. Remember, by then the greatest of his plays had already been written. 154 sonnets. Who were they addressed to? People are still guessing who is W.H. and who is the dark lady. Maybe Shakespeare derived some kind of pleasure by allowing a sense of mystery to creep in so people can keep guessing. Of course, some people have identified W.H. as the Earl of Pembroke. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. And why the dark lady? Was she dark? Or is she called the dark lady because she was mysterious? Some have even suggested that she was probably a maid of Queen Elizabeth. But whatever that may be, what is more important to us is the quality of the sonnets. The undying greatness of the sonnets which make them popular even today not only to students of literature, but also to all great lovers of English poetry. What are the two main themes that he talks about in these sonnets? The theme of love and the theme of friendship. Love for a lady and friendship for a friend. And that is why you probably have W.H. who is the friend and the dark lady to whom all the love sonnets are addressed. I want to talk about the form of the sonnet. All of you know that the sonnet has 14 lines. But how does Shakespeare divide these 14 lines? The 14 lines are divided into three quatrains and one couplet. Very soon I will show you a sonnet to make this clearer. But at the moment, let us understand what we mean by three quatrains. A quatrain is a four-lined stanza. So quick arithmetic, four lines, three stanzas, three into four, we have twelve lines. Have you got that, my dear students? A quatrain is a four-lined stanza. Now you have three stanzas. So how many lines does that make? Four into three or 4 plus 4 plus 4, that is 12 lines. Now you've got two more lines left and that is the couplet. This is what we call the Shakespearean sonnet, which is different from the Petrarchan sonnet, where you have 8, 6, whereas here you've got 4, 4, 4 and 2. Am I confusing you? Shall I say that again? The 14 lines are divided into three stanzas of four lines each and the concluding two lines is a couplet. You know a couplet is two lined stanza. So all Shakespeare's sonnets are written in the same form of three quatrains followed by a couplet. And what is interesting is very often the first 12 lines give you a certain idea about the topic and in the last two lines it totally changes and he says something exactly the opposite. You know there is one favourite sonnet of mine where he talks about, he describes his lady love and he says that she is very dark and her hair is like snake and when she walks it seems as if there is an earthquake etc etc. So for the first 12 lines you get an impression that there is nothing good about his lady love. But in the last two lines Shakespeare totally changes and what does he say? But for all the world I will not exchange her for anyone else. Do you get the point my dear students? The couplet totally changes the idea that he has been talking about earlier. Let me very quickly show you what I meant by four quatrains. Can we read the sonnet? Can you read it with me so that it becomes clear? Let me not to the marriage of two minds admit impediments. Full stop, right? So you pause there. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. This is the first quatrain. 
what is Shakespeare talking about? Shakespeare is talking about love. Remember, I told you one of the most favorite topics, themes, which the Elizabethan poets had in their sonnets was love. And that is as true for Shakespeare as it was for other poets. I want you to look at the sonnet carefully so that you understand how Shakespeare's sonnets are formed. So this is the first quatrain where he says there can be no impediment to true love. It does not alter just because the beloved has altered. It cannot be removed. You cannot use an eraser to rub it. It just cannot be rubbed when you want to rub it. Let's look at the second quatrain. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose words unknown although his height be taken. What does he say? You can have a tempest, you can have a storm, you can have a typhoon, you can have a cyclone, but this will never be shaken. It is like what? It is like the star. You remember the Dhruvtara, the pole star. It is like the pole star which never changes. Remember, the pole star is always in the same place in the sky. So, love according to Shakespeare is like that. This, my dear students, is the second quatrain. The second four lines. So, how many lines of the sonnet have we looked at? Four plus four. Can we go back and quickly look at that? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose words unknown although his height be taken. Let's look at the third quatrain that is lines 9 to 12. 9, 10, 11, 12. Four more lines. Love's not time's fool, the rosy lips and cheeks within the bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Life, love, according to the poet, according to Shakespeare, does not change with time. That is, beauty may go, somebody might become old, but that does not mean that love will disappear. Even though time comes and cuts down beauty, he says love will stay on. This is the third quatrain. So we finished 12 lines, my dear students. And now let's look at the last two lines. Remember, this is the couplet. 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 2 now. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved. He moves away. He was talking about love being eternal. And then in the last two lines he says, if this is wrong, I'm not a poet at all. You know, it's like a challenge. Can anyone challenge me and say this is wrong? Shakespeare says, no. If this be error and upon me proved, if anyone can prove that this is wrong, I will say that I have never written any poem. I have given you the sonnet, my dear students, and talked about it in detail because I want you to be able to appreciate the form in which Shakespeare's poetry, Shakespeare's sonnets were written. I also wanted to show you how Shakespeare deals with the main theme of the sonnet. What is the main theme? Love. What kind of a sonnet it is? It is a Shakespearean sonnet. It is an English sonnet, not to be confused with the Italian sonnet or the Petrarchan sonnet, which had a completely different form. Let's now go on to the third kind of poetry about which I want to talk to you. I told you that I'll begin by talking about his long poems, then I'll go on to talk about his sonnets, and then I'll talk about the songs in his plays. When we think of the Indian movies of today, we think that there are songs and we cannot think of a Hindi movie, my dear students, without a song. So too was it in the drama of the Elizabethan age. But remember, in those days there were no playback singers and therefore the artist, the actor or the actress herself or himself sang the song. 
In most of Shakespeare's plays, it is the women character who have songs. Some of the songs are most beautiful. I can think of Ophelia's song in Hamlet when she is about to commit suicide, when she's about to drown herself. But before I come to that, I just want to tell you in passing that in Shakespeare's days, in the Elizabethan age, there were no actresses, that is, no women performed on the stage. So it was young boys who did the role of women too, that is, boys before. Their voice broke when they had, when they were young enough to have a voice like that of a girl. So it was these young boys who performed the role of the girls, that is, the women characters in Shakespeare's plays. Anyway, that is just some passing information for you. I'm talking about the third kind of poetry that Shakespeare wrote, and that is the songs in his plays. What are they? What is important? in the quality of the songs. Number one, the lyrical quality. As I keep saying again and again in this lecture, the great melody that comes across in the poetry of the Elizabethan age, it's almost as if you can sing the poems because there's a lyrical quality. We talk about the lyricism of Shelley in the Romantic age. It is that kind of lyrical quality that you find in the songs, in the plays of Shakespeare. There are some critics who suggest that maybe these songs are not original songs. That is, the songs probably existed in some form or the other in the Elizabethan age. Shakespeare probably heard them, picked them up, made some changes to suit the context in the play and put it into his plays. Of course, the hand of Shakespeare, the style of Shakespeare is there. So he must have done something to the songs, even if they were not original songs. Of course, most of you do know that even his plays, the themes of his plays, the plots of his plays were not original. Many of them were taken from earlier stories. Many of them were taken from history. But Shakespeare, in his own inimitable, unique style, made it his own and therefore we do not think of where the story of Hamlet or King Lear or Julius Caesar came from. To us they are the plays, the tragedies, the great tragedies of Shakespeare. So too with the songs I would like to tell you that maybe the songs were not original but he gave them his own, his own feel for the language. In the songs, it's not as if all the songs are similar. It's not as if all the songs are of the same quality. It is not as if all the songs are of the same level, of the same standard. He's got different kinds of songs. What do I mean by kinds of songs? There are songs which are perfect. There are songs which are so graceful. But at the same time, there are songs which seem like nonsensical verse. That is, he could choose songs, he could fit songs into the, into, the, into the play in such a way that they suited the context particularly perfectly well. It seems as if the songs were written particularly for that play. That was Shakespeare's great ability. The quality of the song could be different, but the quality of the song would be perfect for the situation, for the context in which it is placed, for the character who is going to sing it, for the development of the theme, for the scene, for the situation, Shakespeare could place it so beautifully. That is Shakespeare's contribution to the use of the song in his plays. So you have some nonsensical verse, you have some graceful, perfect songs, you have some rustic songs. Rustic, you know the village, the shepherds and shepherdesses. We've got so many plays in which the characters, Rosalind, you would remember, takes on the role of a shepherd. So also in many other plays, you have shepherds and shepherdesses. You could go to a play like A Midsummer Night's Dream, where it is all set out in the open. So you do see a kind of rusticity, rustic right comes from the word the villager, the rural, not the urban sophisticated English that you would probably hear in the court, but a kind of English that you would hear in the village folk. 
speak, the common people, the rural, the farmer, you would have songs to suit that category too. Shakespeare would use the kind of language that was appropriate to the rustic characters. Shakespeare had great sense of humour. This humour, the comedy, as we see even in some of his great tragedies like the gravedigger scene in Hamlet, you might remember some of you my dear students. So you have humour. But in his songs, the humour is very often wry. You know what is wry humour? The kind of humour that makes one, one part of your lip go up. You know, you smile like that. That is wry humour. So in some of his songs, you see that wry humour too. And of course, you have the dirges, the sad song. Remember, I talked about Ophelia's song, the willow song. When she comes, when she thinks that Hamlet does not love her, when she feels unloved and unwanted and does not want to live anymore. And then she comes and she sings that beautiful song, the willow song. It is a dirge. A dirge is a sad, sad song. So in Shakespeare's plays, you have a variety of songs. The great Shakespeare could choose the correct mood, the correct tone, the correct language, the correct style for each song to suit perfectly the play in which the song had to be placed. The situation, the scene, the character, the theme, the plot, all this would play a part before he fit in a song. Nowhere does the song seem to be unwanted or unwarranted. So Shakespeare as a poet could add to the beauty of his plays by the addition of the songs. It is not as if he did something which no one had done before. As I said earlier, songs were an innate, intrinsic part of the drama of that time. <coughs> Let us look at the features of his poetry. I have talked about three kinds of poetry. When we are looking at Shakespeare's poetry, we have looked at three kinds of poetry. We have looked at his long poems, we have looked at his sonnets and we have also looked at his songs. But I would like to draw your attention to some of the characteristic features of his poetry. Whatever kind of poetry that we are looking at, when we look at Shakespeare as a poet, I think these features, these characteristic features do come to our mind. Number one is imagination. I need not repeat Shakespeare's ability for imagination. How he could convert an ordinary story by the use of his imagination is there for us to see in all his plays. So you have imagination. You have imagery. Imagery is not to be confused with imagination. Imagery is what you see and which I mentioned earlier. You could have the imagery, the animal imagery you could have, which he has used very beautifully in King Lear and also in his long poem. There is wit and humour. Shakespeare wrote great tragedy, but he also wrote great comedy. And in this comedy, you see his wit and humour. You see the same kind of wit and humour in his poetry also. I talked about the sonnet. Remember the example of the sonnet I gave you when I told you how he was de uh, describing his beloved and one would imagine that no beloved would want to be described that way. Shakespeare has that humour. Shakespeare was probably the greatest master of the metaphor. He never said anything directly that could be said indirectly. What do I mean by that? He could use metaphors, similes for almost every experience under the sun, for almost every description. And we see that quality in his poetry also. You know, when he talks about love in the sonnet that I talked to you about, when he talks about love being like the pole star, when he talks about time's sickle, what does that mean? He is using the sickle as a, as a metaphor. 
for the passage of time to cut down beauty right you cut down grass with a sickle so time cuts down beauty shakespeare was an expert in the use of metaphor and simile and then of course his dramatic quality as i mentioned earlier we remember shakespeare more for his plays than we do for his poetry but he's able to bring that same dramatic quality into his poems also what is a dramatic quality the quality of action the quality of something happening the quality of something happening before our own eyes when he's able to describe that in his songs in his sonnets in his long poems we call it the dramatic quality and then of course you have symbolism also a symbol a pratik is something when one stands for the other a metaphor is a single comparison but when it goes on for a long period of time then we call it a symbol if it is repeated if it draws our attention in such a way that one represents the other one of the simple symbols that you could immediately think of my dear students is probably a white pigeon standing for peace we always talk of a white pigeon or a white flag for example now that is a symbol so also in shakespeare's poetry in shakespeare's songs you see a lot of these symbols so what are the characteristic features that we see in all his poems what are the characteristic features that we see in all his poems imagination wit and humor dramatic quality imagery metaphor symbolism these qualities are there in all his poems whether they are the songs whether they are the sonnets or whether they are the long poems can we quickly try and recapture what we have done in this lecture we have tried to understand the elizabethan age the characteristic features of the poetry of the elizabethan age we've had a quick look at some of the major poets of the elizabethan age then we came to shakespeare we looked at shakespeare as a poet in order to understand shakespeare as a poet i tried and explained to you three kinds of poetry that shakespeare wrote i talked about his two long poems which most of you will probably never read but doesn't matter you should at least know what it is about because we are talking about shakespeare as a poet and then i talked about his sonnets i talked to you about what a sonnet is how shakespearean sonnet is different from a petrarchan sonnet how it is called the english sonnet and how it is different from the italian sonnet then i talked about the sonnet in particular one sonnet in order to make you understand how shakespeare sonnet was written in the sense that how he divided his 14 lines into three quatrains followed by a sonnet after that i gave you a quick idea about shakespeare's songs that he has in his plays the kind of songs that he has the range of his songs the importance of the songs and then we moved on finally to a study of the characteristic features of shakespeare's poetry and i repeat again that these features are seen in all his poetry so when you are attempting an answer on shakespeare as a poet remember you will talk about the characteristic features you'll talk about his major poems of course before you do that you will place him in the elizabethan age but remember my dear students you will also have to look at these topics from different types of questions you might have the long answer that you would want to write you might have to answer in answer in short you might have to answer in one or two sentences and you will have to answer your mcqs so what do you do i'm sure as you've been listening to this lecture and to many other lectures like this you have been making your own notes your running notes my dear students are very important in all these lectures because if you have these notes in front of you you can always go back to the text 
recheck with the text and get ready for your examination. So look at the characteristic features, make a quick note of them. Remember the kinds of sonnets that he wrote. Think about the songs in his plays. Remember the two major poems, the long poems that he wrote. Their names a little difficult for you, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece. But if you have jotted them down, you can certainly remember the spelling. Because remember, in our MCQs, the spellings too could be important if we are looking at something like fill in the blanks. So remember that Shakespeare was a great dramatist, but we also have to remember him as a great poet. Shakespeare's contribution to poetry, Shakespeare's poetry, Shakespeare as a poet of the Elizabethan age is what we have looked at in this lecture. I hope you have understood the lecture and you have enjoyed the lecture as much as I have had. Thank you. Sandhan All Gujarat Integrated Classroom Satellite Na Madhyam Ti Jodh Ti Kadi Ekle Sandhan